Good evening. Hello, all. Welcome to our third virtual naturalist night of 2021. My name is Olivia Dice. I am the restoration and stewardship coordinator with Wilderness Workshop. Thank you all for being here this evening. Before we begin, I would like to recognize the Tabwatch Ute Nation as the past, present, and future caretakers of this land. Prior to colonization in the 1800s, countless generations of this nomadic tribe followed both herds and the weather, establishing summer camps located throughout what we call today the Roaring Fork and Colorado River Valleys. If you know whose land you're on this evening, please share that via the chat as well. We would love to hear from you. And if you don't, I encourage you to learn more about that after um, our conversation this evening. Naturalist Nights is a free speaker series in the Roaring Fork Valley, offered through a partnership between Wilderness Workshop, um, Roaring Fork Audubon, and the Aspen Center for Environmental Studies. Naturalist Nights have taken place for 10 weeks every winter in both Aspen and Carbondale for, or, for over 20 years now. This year's Modified Naturalist Night series includes five virtual presentations, one every two weeks, plus a Spanish translation for each to be posted afterwards. The presentations will be recorded and posted on each of our organization's websites shortly after the talk as well. And though we are unable to gather in person tonight, we're very excited to be bringing the magic of Naturalist Nights into your home. There will be a question and answer portion at the end of tonight's presentation. And as always, we would love to hear from you. If you're joining via Zoom, please go ahead and type your questions right into the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. If you're joining us through Facebook, please go ahead and type your question directly into the comment section. We're all very excited to be learning together as a community this evening. I would also like to thank our generous sponsors that help make our Naturalist Night series a success. These businesses provide financial and in-kind donations to cover expenses, making Naturalist Nights possible. Our next virtual presentation will be live online in just two Thursdays on February 18th at 6 o'clock p.m. We will be hosting Melanie Chukas Bradley, who is an author and certified forest bathing guide, and she will be presenting on forest bathing in your own wild home. And now it is my great, great privilege to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Lucretia Olson. Lucretia is an ecologist with the Rocky Mountain Research Station, which is the research arm of the U.S. Forest Service. She's located in Missoula, Montana, which is the perfect location to enjoy all of her favorite activities like hiking and cross-country skiing. Her work focuses on modeling the habitat needs and distribution of small forest carnivores like Canada lynx and fishers, as well as their response to disturbances such as fires, insects, and human activities. She loves that her job allows her to provide land managers with the best possible science in order to make informed decisions to protect our wildlife populations. I'm so honored to be hosting Lucretia tonight and learning about a topic that is so close, near and dear to our hearts here in the Rocky Mountains. So with all that said, I would love to welcome Lucretia on screen. How are you doing tonight, Lucretia? Hi, I'm doing good. Wonderful. Well, it looks like we have almost 60 people joining us live on Zoom at the moment, and you are coming in loud and clear. So with all that said, we're so excited to learn from you. Take it away. Great. Okay. Hopefully we can do some uh, more interacting when we get to the questions. So before I get started, I'd just like to acknowledge my co-authors and collaborators, John Squires, who's also at the Rocky Mountain Research Station, Liz Roberts, who is an ecologist with the White River National Forest, and Jake Ivan, who works uh, with the Colorado Parks and Wildlife, all have been um, invaluable partners in this research and we have been working on um, studying lynx in Colorado for since 2010 now, so it's been a great partnership. And before we get into um, more of the details, I just want to let you know that what I'll be talking about tonight um, has all been covered in some published papers. Um, which are available totally of free on the web that you can access. I think the links have been available in the chat for you. So if anybody wants to dive further into the science, um, there are three papers that go with this on um, just recreation itself and then on how links are reacting to recreation in two different, um, the habitat paper and a behavior paper. So 
please feel free to check those out if you're um, interested in more details. And so tonight I am going to um, try to answer three questions for you. Um, I'm going to try to figure out why we are concerned with wildlife and recreation by talking about um, how recreation affects other species and what links needs um, links need for this um, their uh, habitat. I will talk about how recreation affects links. So through habitat use or through behavior, how, how are links affected by recreation? And then I'm gonna talk about what this means for the future of links in Colorado. So first of all, why are we concerned about wildlife and recreation? Well, all of us in the past year, I think, have seen how the pandemic and people being kind of stuck in their homes and locked down has affected animals. Like we've seen lots of images in the news where the absence of people has encouraged animals to come down and to, as this little goat is doing, eat the bushes outside of buildings where they usually don't occur. So we know that um, people and the presence of people influences the behavior and the locations of animals. And other studies have shown that um, recreation and winter recreation in particular affects um, how animals uh, exist. So this study on snowmobiles and wolves and elk has shown that um, in Yellowstone National Park, showed that both wolves and elk had higher stress hormones in um, areas and times of high snowmobile use. So when there was more snowmobiles, the wolves and the elk felt more stressed out. Um, another study on backcountry skiing and mountain caribou in Canada, <clears throat> and this showed that um, when the backcountry skiers were present, the use of those areas by the caribou declined. So it actually pushed the caribou into lower elevations which made them um, more susceptible to contact with coyotes and predators, so um, more, con more susceptible to predation. And their response was strong even when there was low numbers of skiers. So like 12 people was enough to push these caribou out of the places that they um, really wanted to be. And then we also know um, about ski resorts and Pacific Martin in this study from Lake Tahoe which found that uh, fragmentation from ski runs, so splitting up the forest affected how Martin moved. And they found that occupancy, so how many Martins were living in the area was lower during the ski season. And they even found that density of females in particular was lower during the ski season. And that's important because the females are the ones having the babies and that would really affect the population. So all these are pretty important effects on these different species from winter recreation. And we see from this graph, which is actually from another paper, um, that this is a summary of all the studies that we know of that have been done on recreation and their effects on animals. Over here on the left is the type of recreation. So we have aquatic recreation, snow-based recreation, and terrestrial recreation. And over here on the right is how it affects animals. And this blue means negative, and the yellow, which is really tiny, means positive. And what we want to notice here is that the snow-based recreation in the middle here has some of the highest negative effects and also some of the smallest sample sizes. This is how many people are actually studying that thing, which means we don't know that much about how snow-based recreation affects lynx or any animals. And what we do know is that it has primarily been negative. So all of this gives us some concern about how recreation um, is affecting lynx. And so we wanted to, um, undertake a study to see, um, should, we be, should we be worried about lynx? So why might we be worried about lynx in particular? Canada lynx are picky, basically. They are a specialist carnivore, so they have a diet that requires them to feed almost completely on uh, snowshoe hares. And um, in Colorado, they will eat some alternate prey like red squirrels, but um, snowshoe hares are you know, kind of hard to find and red squirrels have been kind of affected by uh, beetle kill. So you know, prey is sometimes scarce for lynx. And also these types of prey require a very specific habitat. So lynx and those snowshoe hares and squirrels require forests with high horizontal cover. So um, big, uh, lots of ground cover, like in this picture, lots of shrubs that go, you know, that the, short, the hares can forage on. Lots of trees with branches that go clear to the ground so the hares can hide. It's very specific what they need. And they also need a mature multi-story forest. So they want a bunch of big trees, they want a bunch of medium trees, they want some small trees. They need a lot of uh, varied forest and they're specific in um, what type as well. They want a spruce fir forest. So these are kind of boreal forests that are wetter 
they're more productive. They kind of look like this uh, forest in the background. And those forests are kind of hard to come by in Colorado because a lot of the forest is a little bit drier. Finally, climate also plays a role in why we're worried about lynx. Um, lynx and hares are cold and snow adapted. So we can see from these pictures, lynx have these giant feet that let them um, stay on top of the snow and, and move really easily through deep snow. And hares have that same thing as well, snowshoe hares. And what we're worried about with climate is that we'll get climate change, which causes, causes vegetation change, which will cause a prey change. So maybe uh, the, the like boreal forests that I was referencing will be drier and that will push the hares out and um, cause lynx to have a food shortage. And also our hares are affected by climate change in their um, phenology, which is when hares turn from white to brown, if they're mismatched with their background, if the snow melts earlier than they're expecting, then the poor hare sticks out like a sore thumb and he's easily caught by lots of, of um, animals making him more scarce. And finally, loss of snow also increases competition to these lynx. Lynx, like I was saying, are really adapted for snow and that generally keeps competing predators like coyotes out of an area because the coyotes don't like to flounder through deep snow with their little tiny feet. But once the snow is gone, the coyotes can get in there and compete with lynx for this food source. So all of those things kind of make us worried about lynx and lead to the fact that lynx have a narrow distribution in Colorado. So um, lynx, as we um, may or may not know, were introduced, reintroduced to Colorado in 1999. They had been extirpated in the 70s. And so they have kind of uh, moved into the San Juans is where they were reintroduced and they filled in the landscape um, where they could live. And this uh, photo is showing a lot of the mountainous areas is actually above, you know, where lynx want to live. It's snowy, it's icy, they can't make a living there. And you can kind of see along the background, this little ribbon of forest, and that's where lynx are limited to in this whole big landscape. And this kind of backs up that, this is an actual lynx uh, with the GPS collar on. I'm gonna talk about more about that a little bit later, but each of these little dots here is showing us a lynx, an actual lynx location. And you can see on this map, they're strung out in this little mid-level elevation range of trees that's along this valley. And here are all these um, high elevation mountain areas with just snow and, and rock where lynx don't live. So they're in these really uh, you know, stringy, kind of stretched out home ranges, doing the best they can, but in uh, kind of not in a nice big home range. So they're already a little bit um, on edge in Colorado. It's the southern edge of their distribution. So they're already kind of struggling. And then another reason that we're worried about lynx in this area is that recreation in Colorado is very intense, as you guys probably know, and it's increasing. <clears throat> so this um, is a picture maybe some of you have seen from the Vale um, area last year, I think. There was a huge dump of snow and a ton of people turned out. Uh, you know, these photos are just incredible to me how many. Uh, people were in line for that lift line. I don't think this is all the time, but that's just a huge amount of people on the landscape that we are concerned with maybe are um, going to be influencing how lynx are existing in those areas. So finally, we wanna know how does recreation affect lynx? We know that lynx and recreation co-occur in Colorado. So we know that lynx are, are in the same place as we wanna be when we're snowmobiling and skiing. We predict that lynx might be negatively affected by what we have learned from those other species and that review chart that we looked at. But what we don't know is how they'll be affected, if it will be through space use, like how they're using the landscape, or if it will be through behavior changes, like how they move or how they use an area. And we don't know the impact of different types of recreation or intensities of recreation. So will snowmobiles, like motorized, affect them differently than non-motorized recreation? Will low intensity versus high intensity affect them? All these things we don't really know yet. We undertook a study to answer those questions and we started this in 2010 and we wanted to quantify winter recreation with the same kind of high resolution and really intense methods that we use to monitor the links in our study. So we um, actually kind of uh, gave the same technology to humans as we marked our links with. So we gave each um, recreationist a um, this little GPS unit down here, the tiny little um, handheld GPS, like a sports monitor. 
and people just volunteered to carry these for us. We did a, a trailheads and portals and we told people about what we were doing and um, people were really excited to help with the project, which was great. Like they wanted to help links and they wanted to help us understand where recreations were going. So we got a ton of volunteers and a ton of great data from recreationists on um, carrying these units. We gave them to all types of recreation. So like I was saying, we, we monitored snowmobilers, we did um, hybrid snowmobile skiing. So someone pulling a skier on a um, snowmobile. We did backcountry skiing um, or snowboarding. So like dispersed off trail skiing. We did snowshoes and pack trail or cross country skiers on pack trails. And we even did some helicopter skiers, um, but we didn't have a big enough sample size to really look at um, that statistically. And we gave out one GPS unit per group of people. And then we also emailed the participant their track as an incentive. So everybody who participated in our project got a map showing where they had been for the day. And here's a picture, an example of someone carrying one of our units. They just sat on their back of their backpack like that and collected GPS data. This is just a, a slide of how many recreation tracks we sampled. We sampled a ton. So from 2010 to 2013 over uh, two different study areas, the Vail Pass area and the San Juans kind of mountains. We studied 3,000, we collected 3,000 recreation tracks, which was a total of about 56,000 kilometers of uh, recreation. So a really nice sample of um, recreation out on the landscape. And then concurrently, we captured Canada lynx. So we did this at the same time so that we could see what lynx and recreationists were doing on the same, on the landscape. Um, we captured lynx in these box traps. So we make them out of PVC and wire. And lynx are really nice to live trap. They, we put some snow in there for them to drink. We put a leg of deer in them for them to eat. And they just kind of hunker down and they sit. They don't panic. They don't hurt themselves. They just wait for us to come and let them out. So they're a, a nice animal to work with. That's another guy coming out of the trap all processed. <clears throat> when we catch them, we... Um, anesthetize them and we put this collar on them. This is a GPS collar. So um, this is a little GPS portion. It connects with a satellite and takes a recorded location. We did, we programmed the collars to take a location once per hour, 24 hours a day. So we knew what links were doing um, basically all day, all winter long. The collars we make sure are less than 3% of the body mass of the links. So that has been um, shown in other studies to not bother links, not bother these animals. They're a store on board collar, which means they keep all of the data in this little computer on the collar. And then we have to go find the collar out in the woods again to get the data. So to do that, they're equipped with a drop off mechanism, which actually waits until a specified day and then pops off. So the collar actually just drops off and falls off the links. And then we have a VHF receiver that we go and look for it and find it to bring it back and get the data. And then as a backup, we actually have a rotaway mechanism, which is this little canvas band right here. And we um, sew that into the collar so that if the drop off fails, the um, canvas will get wet and will eventually degrade and this collar will fall off anyway, so that there's no chance that the lynx will be stuck with this collar for its life. There's a lynx wearing our collar. Um, the antenna faces against the sky and they just collect data the whole time that they're wearing it. And then if there's the rotaway, it just pops off. Here's our study areas. So here's Denver up in the corner. This is just a portion of Colorado. Um, we have a Vail study area. It was the Vail Pass Winter Recreation Area that we focused on for dispersed recreation. This little polygon is our uh, recreation polygon. And then these white uh, overlapping circles are Lynx home ranges. And then down here, we had a second one um, in the San Juan Mountains near Telluride. Again, this polygon is the footprint of the recreation that we studied. And then here's all the links home ranges overlapping inside that polygon. So two study areas kind of with varying um, degrees of recreation intensity. There was way more recreation at this Vail study area than there was down here in the San Juans. And so for our Canada lynx sample size, we caught 18 lynx um, over, two, over the two study areas, nine males and nine females. Like I said, we did the work from 2010 to 2013. We documented 64,000 GPS locations, which is great. That was a nice big sample and let us um, do a lot of analyses with the data. And we primarily sampled from January through March. So just that winter season overlapping with recreation. Here's just an overview of our links locations. So you can kind of see where the links were on the landscape that we captured them. Here's Vale up here, here's Carbondale. Down here is Telluride. 
There's a zoom in of the veil pass. So each color here is a separate link. So you can see we got several individuals. There's our, you know, a few nine of our individuals. Um, and you know, kind of using, like I was saying, they're a little bit strung out. They're along these valleys. There's Leadville. So we ended up with kind of a veil area and a Leadville area. And then here's the San Juan study area. They're a little more um, spread out as well. They're kind of along these valleys and in these tree regions, like we were saying. There's Telluride right in the middle. And so we can use that data that we collected from the recreationists and from the links, and we can make these maps. So this is a recreation map. This is the data that we got from those little GPS recorders that I was showing you that each recreation is carried. And each little line here that you can see, these tiny faint lines, is a trip from a recreationist. So they, there's a ton of them on this surface. You can see how each one adds up into the trail that, that they're covering. This one is a snowmobile. So you can see that the snowmobiles are following these trails and they're, they're coming up to this play area to kind of high mark. You can see the little individual trails right there. Here's a backcountry ski. Um, recreation area, everybody's coming down through the trees. Here's a hybrid ski, so you can see where they're on the snowmobile and this trail's getting towed and then where they come down off the mountain being skiing. And here's one of the heli skiing um, trails. You can see the helicopter skiing is basically above tree line, maybe even above where lynx are. So this gave us some great data that we had never had before on what type of habitat uh, these recreationists were actually using so we could see if it was gonna conflict with what lynx were doing. Here's just a couple cool pictures. This is the Vail Pass recreation area. Um, same colors, orange is snowmobile, green is hybrid, blue is uh, backcountry ski, just for skiing. Here's I-70 along the bottom here. This is Mollus Pass, so a big area of Mollus. You can see the snowmobile area here and some people skiing down the edges. And then these dots here are the links locations. So then we're able to overlap our recreation data with our links data. So, now we have this really cool ability to look at where lynx are using landscape and where recreationists are using the landscape. Here's another one. You can see the dispersed skiing and the lynx are just all over around this whole area. This is over. And here's near Ironton. This is a um, pack trail or cross country ski trail. And again, the lynx are really using all these areas. So each little red dot here is a lynx GPS point. So lynx wearing that collar was here. This is one collar, one dot per hour of his movement. There's another one at Mollus Pass. Here's the lynx movements all along here in the forest. And then all of the recreation, of, um, it's a snowmobile uh, moving along here in this more open area. So then we can take this data and we can ask um, specifically, how does recreation affect lynx through habitat? So how can we use these data, the, the tracks that we have from recreationists and the points that we have from lynx, how can we combine those to tell us what these two um, different user groups, I guess we would call them, links and recreationists, how are they using the environment differently? And so we can do a thing called a resource selection function. And that's not super important, but that's the statistical term of the analysis. And what it is, is looking at uh, use. So this little illustration here is showing you a links trail. So each of those dots is a used links point. And then we compare it to random, so available locations. So we have used locations compared to available locations. And at each one of those points, we can ask, what's the environment like where that little point is? So if you were to stick a pin through a map and where would that pin touch? What would the, the ground conditions be like? What would the forest cover be like? What would the elevation be like? What would the slope be like? And then we can kind of see like, if we do all of these points, these used points and looked at canopy cover, say, maybe we would see that there was high canopy cover in general at these used points. And then if we looked at the random maybe random points, we would see maybe the forest cover was, you know, kind of, kind of random itself. So we could compare the forest cover at used points and the forest cover at random points and start to come to some conclusions about, well, links are using higher than expected forest cover. So we know that they need um, kind of forest canopy. So that's the method that we use to uh, analyze the rest of, of this data that I'm gonna talk about for the habitat work. And we looked at multiple environmental attributes. So I'm just gonna um, give you an idea. We looked at elevation, we looked at canopy cover. So like the percent of the forest that's open or covered in trees. We looked at slope, so how um, steep a slope was. We looked at road density. So how many forest roads were in a specific area. 
and we looked at annual precipitation, which was like snow, how much snow are you getting? And we, cause we did all of these because we figured uh, links and recreationists would probably be tuning in to these types of, of attributes when they picked where they lived or where they recreated. And these maps over here show you the two areas. So this is the Vale area and this is the San Juans area. This is elevation, a map of elevation. So you can kind of see already like links are using areas that are a little higher in elevation compared to, you know, maybe this more available area out here. And then this is uh, canopy cover. So green means forested. You can see the links are in these forested areas. So we can kind of, when we do this analysis, we would stack up this elevation and these canopy covers. We look at all these things together and get a picture of what links are using and what recreationists are using. And when we do that, we put it all together and we get this surface. So this is a predicted surface showing where we expect links to be in Colorado. Here's our two study areas. Here's the Vale study area, that polygon I showed you before, and here's the Telluride study area I showed you before. And we can see on the side, just looking at what we're um, kind of breaking down what we're doing, here's the ground. So here's an actual picture of the forest, and we can kind of see like these forested areas that we talked about before that are good lynx habitat. We can see those and that's where the lynx are living. These are the GPS locations of the lynx. And then when we put those together, these are the um, high predicted probability areas that the lynx are living in. So we can make this map and see where the lynx are living with these red areas and where they're probably not with these blue areas. And then we can do the same thing for the recreationists. So this is that same model but with snowmobiles and hybrid skis and backcountry skis. So we basically can just say, what do these types of recreation like and what do links like and what happens when we overlap those? And when we overlap them, we can do this model where we put in each type of recreation and links. So um, this allows us to compare directly what kind of links habitat, what links are using and what recreationists are using. This lets us look at similarities and differences of the habitat and it will show us important environmental attributes that, are, um, that we could use to figure out where links are living and where recreationists are, are using and maybe how those two are separate or similar. <clears throat> so if we look closely at one of these maps, this is canopy cover. The black is links and all these colors are different types of recreation. This is the value of canopy cover from low to high. And this is the probability of links use from low to high. So we see links are much more probable at really high canopy covers. They like forest and all the recreators, well, they like more open areas. And even the skiers, this blue, that's the backcountry skiers that we saw coming down through the trees. They like trees, but not nearly as much as lynx. So we could use this to say, well, maybe lynx are not um, going to be in the same forests as recreationists necessarily because um, they're just picking different habitat. They, they like deeper forests than people are willing to go into. And we can look at this same map for all of those environmental attributes that I showed you before. So a few of these, there's a bunch of them, so we don't need to really worry about all of them, but we can pick out a couple to talk about. This road density here is kind of interesting. All the recreationists really like roads and links do not, not as much. So this kind of tells us if you put a road in somewhere, links are not going to be thrilled, but you'll probably get a bunch of recreationists. An annual precipitation, which is kind of snow basically, Recreationists, of course, love a ton of snow. They like a ton of snow, but lynx, they're much more moderate in this. So they're like at those mid-level elevations with a little more moderate of snow. So we can use all of these to say, maybe lynx are not um, in as much conflict with recreation as we thought because they're just separating themselves out naturally along some of these gradients, along canopy cover, along snow, along road density. And the data kind of bear this out. So if we look at Mollus Pass, Here's a close-up of, um, of the forest imagery. So you can see where things are nice and forested and where they're more open. We can put our links points on here and our recreation points. And you can see the links fill in where these forests are and the snowmobilers go in where it's open. And we can see that again in Vail Pass. Here's a um, map showing Vail Pass. Here's I-70 along the bottom here. And we can see where the forested areas are. If we put our recreation surfaces trails on here, you can see the recreators are using this area over here. We can put our links on. And then when we add them together, we can see links are much more in these forested areas. The recreationists are in these more open areas. So we can kind of start to see when it comes to habitat, links are kind of uh, 
spatially partitioning themselves apart from recreation, just naturally based on, on what the lynx prefer. Now we can kind of look at uh, lynx movement behavior instead of habitat. So instead of asking where the recreation is, now we're going to ask how intense recreation is um, and what that does to lynx. So we looked at this by um, looking at our recreation tracks again. So this is a map of backcountry ski tracks and we trans transformed those ski tracks into an intensity surface. So if there was a ton of tracks, like right up here by Telluride, it became a hot red and it became a high intensity. And if there's very few tracks, it's this cool blue and we know there wasn't much intensity. And then we can compare these intensities as a um, input, like an environmental attribute, like we just did at links locations. So we can see what intensity of recreation are at those exact links locations that the links are using. And so we use this intensity map to look at movement speed and temporal activity of links compared to recreation intensity. We looked at movement speed because we were wondering, we thought uh, movement speed was probably indicative of how links are moving around the landscape and foraging. So if you're forced to move too fast, maybe you are scared and you're being pushed through an area and you're not given the time to um, stop and hunt. And if you are um, too slow, Maybe you are hunkering down and you're kind of hiding and you're not able to um, stalk prey. You're not able to move out of an area that's not ideal. So either a slow or a fast response um, could be indicative of some kind of disturbance from recreation. And we also looked at temporal activity to see um, are links changing their activity based on um, day or night. So links are generally uh, crepuscular mostly, which means they're active during dawn and dusk, but they also kind of spread their activity out across the 24 hour cycle. So they don't have a huge um, diurnal signal. They will do, um, they're active kind of any time. So if they change this activity, we'll know that they're responding to some kind of disturbance. We also looked at links use versus available points um, relative to recreation intensity so that we could see if links are avoiding recreation intensity. And we examined links behavior around developed ski areas. So here are some of the results from that. There's a lot of charts, but I'm gonna to try to walk through them slow. This is a, a graph showing the types of recreation that we studied. Um, so hybrid backcountry ski, snowmobile, or packed trail ski. It's showing recreation intensity along the bottom from low to high, and it's showing movement speed along the side from low to high. So if you moved, um, if you're faster over here, or if you're slower down here, and what we see here is that links slowed their movement speed in the presence of greater snowmobile activity here. So they're slower over here where there's more snowmobile and in more backcountry ski. But they increased their movement speed where there was more hybrid activity and where there was more pack trail ski. So links are showing a response to these various types of recreation. In particular, snowmobiles and backcountry skis are the types of recreation that are most uh, dense on the landscape. And we're seeing more of a slowing down response to them. So when there's a lot of recreation and when it's really intense, links are hunkering down and they're just kind of waiting it out and sitting, sitting still. And then we looked at temporal differences. So this is when links are active, what times. This is a um, similar graph. So hybrid activity, backcountry skiing, snowmobile and pack trail skis. There's recreation intensity, so low to high recreation intensity, and then activity level. So if you're not active at all versus if you're super active, so like awake and moving around. And this is showing study area, so two, a lot, two different lines for study area, and night and day. We're going to walk through this as well. So what we first notice is that lynx activity was similar when rec recreation intensity was low. So if we look where these little circles are, Day and night, different study areas, it doesn't matter when you don't have much recreation, everybody is kind of, like I said, spreading out their activity overnight and day and not really um, preferring one over the other, They're kind of equally active. So when recreation is low, links are uniformly active over the night and day cycle like they expected. But when recreation is high, so like the Vale study area where we have higher um, recreation, lots of intense recreation, we see uniformly that during the day, that's these red lines now, everybody got less active. So all these lines slant down um, during the day. So during the day, links, when their people are there, links stopped being active, they stopped moving. 
So that kind of backs up our uh, movement speed too. When people are around, when things are busy, the links hunker down, they stop moving. And we can see these are now night and those at Vail. So at night, links got more active. All these lines kind of go up, but for hybrid, they're not really doing anything in response to that one. But in response to snowmobile, backcountry ski, pack trail ski, and all the links um, felt more free to move around and be active in an area um, at night when these types of recreation were not present. Now in San Juan's, the story is a little different. So San Juan's are a less intense study area, and we don't see that same pattern with snowmobile or backcountry ski. So our day and our night lines are almost the same for these. They didn't really change their activity in response to snowmobile or backcountry ski. They did to hybrid and to pack trail ski. We see a little bit less activity in the day than we do in the night. So that same pattern. So basically, if you change your, back, your um, activity in response to recreation, you opt to be more active at night when there are fewer people, if you're a lynx. And then we also have lynx response to snowmobiles. So um, lynx had a very different response to snowmobiles by study area. Um, lynx in Vail, so that's this dotted line, avoided snowmobile intensity, and lynx in the San Juans were actually more likely to be in areas with intense snowmobiles. And this is kind of a study area effect too. We can see here's the Mollus Pass, it's in the San Juans. It has snowmobiles, but it also has lower snowmobile intensity. There's, there's less um, activity overall. And you can see the lynx points are kind of covering this whole area in and out. Whereas in Vail, these are um, three different links represented by the dots. And there's just a ton of recreation over here, hybrid recreation, uh, snowmobile recreation, backcountry skis, and the links are really hanging out away from it and not coming into that area. So we start to see maybe there's some kind of intensity level that links are avoiding with recreation. Same with backcountry ski. However, in backcountry ski, we don't really see a pattern of avoidance. We see um, this is off trail and this is near trails. And if we saw a pattern, we would expect um, links to avoid trails, we would think, because there's a lot of people on a trail. They're using a ski trail. You know, you, there's a ton of uh, skiers on this trail, but we didn't see any evidence of avoidance by links of backcountry skiers. And we can see that with these links um, using this 10th Mountain Hut ski trail. This is near Copper Mountain. So this is a really busy trail. It's going up to one of these huts. There's tons of people up and down this trail and the links are just all over it. So they really seem to be less influenced by non-motorized recreation, even in these um, high intensity recreation areas. And then we looked at individual um, differences. So how do individuals use or avoid recreation? There's a lot going on in this one as well. So this is again, our different types of recreation, our hybrid ski, our backcountry ski, our snowmobiles and our um, pack trail skis. And each one of these is one of our 18 links. So each links gets to say whether they're avoiding recreation down here or whether they're using it. And the dots show how much recreation there is on each links' home range. So what we see is we kind of expected a pattern where as we got more recreation, as these dots went up, we expected there to be more avoidance if links were really bothered by this type of recreation, but we didn't really see that, which was interesting. It's kind of random. Some of them are avoiding it, avoiding is on this side of the line. Some of them are using it, and it doesn't seem to be too related to how much recreation intensity is in their home ranges, except for these individuals that are outlined in these squares. And these two avoided everything. And they also are the ones with the highest amount of recreation. Those are the ones in Vail. So we start to see as you have these amounts of recreation, these high amounts of recreation on your home ranges, maybe you're getting exhausted from it and you're starting to avoid everything. And this is the, those same animals. Um, this is the habitat that they're using and this is what they're avoiding. Those are the ones in the box that I just showed you. And then we finally looked at ski resorts because we figured this would be a highly used area. And we can see from this picture, this is Copper Mountain Ski Resort. Here's all the ski runs. And here is the links use around that resort. And we can see just from this picture that there's avoidance going on of this um, face. They're not really even using these islands in between the runs. And we found that links were using um, ski areas more in the night than in the day and more on the weekdays than the weekends. So they chose non-busy times to be in these areas. 
same ski area. You can see the links back here. They also were more um, present in the ski area during the shoulder season, so spring and summer, than they were during winter. So we found some definite evidence of avoidance of these ski areas. So what does this mean for the future of lynx in Colorado? We see that we learned from our habitat models that lynx show spatial partitioning. So they're separating themselves out from recreation just naturally by preferring forests. And they coupled with behavioral modifications. So we learned that they're changing their activity to more night and they're changing the movement speed. Oops. Um, and that's allowing them to coexist with recreation on the landscape at the intensities that we found. We showed that lynx can tolerate winter recreation in home ranges. Um, we showed, so we know that just having recreation isn't pushing the lynx out of an area, which is great. Um, and they are just are able to kind of use their habitat preferences to live in the same place as what we are using as well. And we learned that from our, our habitat analysis that if we wanna look at how winter recreationists and lynx differ the most um, from those graphs that I showed you, they differ in forest canopy. Lynx like a lot more of it than we do. Um, snow, we like a lot more than lynx do. Um, roads, we also like more roads than lynx do and slope. So if we were thinking about how to manage forests, if we wanted to put these uh, results into action by the forest service or forest managers, we would know that things like building roads or thinning canopy would be something that would make the forest less friendly to lynx. So maybe that's something that we would want to avoid in areas that we were worried about lynx. And from our behavior analysis, we learned that intensity seems to be very important for how lynx um, are able to live with recreation. So we know that when you get more intense recreation, lynx move more slowly. They shifted more to nighttime activity. They avoided areas with um, intense recreation. And when you got up to ski resorts, they avoided the area entirely. And so what we can kind of start to see is a, um, a range of behaviors from low to high intensity. So when you have like the San Juans, which was kind of our lower intensity um, study area, you got a limited response. So they use a lot of the same area that recreationists do and they didn't change their activity levels. When we got to Vail, there was a stronger response. So they avoided those recreation areas. They decreased their activity more. And we had those two links that we looked at that completely avoided recreation. And then when we get to the really strong areas, uh, like ski areas, we saw a ton of avoidance. So they used it far less than random and they used it more at night in the shoulder season. So in total, that really means that we found kind of a nuanced response of Canada links to recreation. We didn't find really the um, strong negative response that we might've expected from what we learned from our other, um, from you know previous work, links aren't pushed out of an area completely. If there's recreation, they can hang on, they can coexist but there might be a threshold um, where we get to like develop ski areas or really intense recreation where they can't coexist and they start to be pushed out of an area. And in the future, um, we have some further concerns for lynx. So we kind of worry about increased recreation intensity and greater resort footprints. So since lynx are um, bothered by recreation intensity, if these uh, if we keep getting more people at recreation intensities or recreation resorts, and if we keep um, expanding ski areas into lynx habitat, which we learned was already kind of uh, sketchily, patchily distributed in Colorado, that could affect how lynx are doing in the state. Another thing that we are worried about is snow bikes. So that's this thing on the left here, um, motorized kind of a snowmobile motorcycle. And since lynx showed a stronger response to motorized recreation, these things can get into the trees. And so if we end up getting a lot more of those, they might kind of bring um, more motorized direct recreation and more disturbance into those forest habitats that lynx um, are using. So that spatial partitioning that we saw might break down. And we are worried about increased wildfire for lynx in general. So um, with all the increased mega fires that we're getting, it's just a few big fires before we lose a ton of lynx habitat on the landscape. and. Um, so that's something to be concerned about for links in the future. So in summary, um, we need to probably monitor what links are doing and do uh, studies, more studies of this type, just to make sure that links are staying on the landscape. They're sticking around, they're not getting pushed off and they're not getting um, extirpated from an area. And we need to 
monitor our own behavior and make sure that we are leaving links the space that they need and the quiet that they need, that um, they can continue to coexist with us as we um, share the slope, basically. So that that's all I have. Um, we can um, stop and ask some questions. Thank you so much. Um, I loved all of those graphs and photos that you had, and especially knowing this area. Um, I know a lot of us are based in Colorado, and so really being able to identify the mountains in some of this range is really, really helpful. We do have a bunch of really wonderful questions, um, so we'll dive into some of those right now. Um, let's see, where should we start? Austin has a great question. Um, he asked, is there a difference in hunting effectiveness for lynx at day and night? And would a temporal shift in behavior due to high recreation intensity lead to reduced hunting success? Great question. <laughs> um, well, snowshoe hares are active a lot at night. So I think that the hunting, you know, for lynx, they're probably focusing on hares. And so they are, that's why they're kind of more crepuscular. That's when hares are um, more active, like at dawn to dusk and more at night. So um, yes, they would have probably better hunting at those, um, those temporal times. Um, and I, I can't remember the rest of your question. Could you tell me again, Olivia? Yes. Sorry. Um, <laughs> Did I get it? So would a temporal shift in behavior potentially lead to reduced hunting success? Mm. It totally could, yes. Um, if we saw lynx, uh, pushed more towards daytime activity, then it would be more of a problem. And the fact that they are kind of moved more into night rather than um, the dawn and dusk might also be a problem. Um, since they're pushing more towards night, it might be um, less of a problem just since that is more when their prey is active. Um, so it could be, but I would say it's probably being pushed more in the better direction than the, than the worse at this point. Awesome. I have another question here um, that I'm curious about too from Deb. What happens to lynx in the summer? Reference to recreation or what do they do? Um, what do they do? What's their range like? And yeah, it would be if you have insight into their any of their recreation habits in the mm -hmm. summer, I think that would be really interesting. So lynx are a little bit happier in the summer. It's a little bit of an easier season. Prey is more available and um, snowshoe hares are more available. So lynx um, in the winter kind of restrict their ranges. They um, are more picky about their habitat in the winter and in the summer um, they expand. So they use more different forest types in the summer. Um, so things are a little bit easier. So I would say the pressure is off a little bit in the summer. We don't really know how um, summer recreation affects them, whether, um, you know, hikers are more out there or with dogs or that kind of thing. Um, that would be a really interesting study to do to see how they're affected by more just people um, running around the landscape versus, you know, there's probably less motorized recreation in the summer in a lot of these places. So I don't know when that would be super cool to find out. Wonderful. I'm really interested in that too. Um, we got a question from Robin and I know that you are located in Montana, but Colorado just recently passed an initiative to reintroduce wolves. And so Robin asked if you anticipate any future competition between wolves and lynx um, and if there's habitat overlap potentially in any other areas where the two coexist, if they do coexist already. <laughs> I think in Montana they coexist. We have wolves and lynx in similar areas. Um, I don't think, we don't have any documented cases of wolves ever um, predating on lynx. Uh, we, I know much more like mountain lions will eat lynx and we even have some crazy stories of fisher in Maine uh, eating lynx. I haven't heard of there being any um, wolf, wolf lynx interactions. So I think you know, in general, I don't think that they are too much in conflict. They're not after the same type of prey and they're not the same type of hunter. Like wolves, wolves are a coursing predator. They'll chase a bunch of animals, whereas a lynx are a sit and wait, like stalking predator. They're more um, slow and more hidden and after uh, tinier prey. So I, I think from that perspective, I wouldn't expect too much conflict between the two. That's great. Um, Let's see, what else do we have? We have a lot of 
a lot of questions of uh, trying to get through here. Um, all right, someone asked, have similar studies been done like this on links in other mountain areas, um, either in the Rocky Mountains or elsewhere? Are people studying links? I know you said that they're in Montana. So are you also doing studies there throughout various ranges in different states? We study a lot of um, other things, but not necessarily recreation in reference to links. And I don't know of any other studies that are focusing specifically on links and recreation, although there is a lot um, of work being done on Eurasian links in Europe um, related to, uh, I think, recreation and other species and just human disturbance in general. So there, there is some going on um, with the different species of links, the Eurasian links, but not here. Um, we study lynx, we are doing more work in Colorado with um, how lynx are using beetle killed habitat. We're doing a bunch of work in Montana studying how lynx respond to wildfire, so recently burned areas um, and forest mosaics, that kind of thing. Um, and there's lots of work on how lynx uh, use the habitat for uh, hares, for hunting. Um, so tons of lynx research going on. But to my knowledge, not much for uh, other recreation studies on lynx. It would be fun to do more. It'd be really cool to do some, uh, some summer work and very cool to look at how this is a correlative study. So we, we, aren't, we didn't actually measure how lynx directly are, are responding to recreation. We just kind of measured the area like you saw. So it would be really cool to be able to say, uh, you know, see if lynx are directly stressed out by a snowmobile or see if they, if you had some links in areas before there was recreation and then you brought in some recreation, how are they responding? So tons of stuff we could do um, in future. Lots more to be done always. Yes. I have a wonderful question here from another Olivia. Um, she asked, let's see, why might the hybrid ski snowmobile be different than just snowmobile effects or just skiing effects? Do you have any like hypothesis for why that happened? Or um, if you found data to back something up, we'd be interested to hear about that. Oh, great question. Um, I kind of think that that is a, a study area effect. So there wasn't a lot of hybrid recreation on the ground in the San Juan study area. It was, it was primarily almost exclusively in that Vail Pass area. So I think that the hybrid um, recreation that we saw is less, uh, it's not being influenced by low intensity, it's only at high intensities. So I'm not sure that we're getting um, a fair representation of what, how links are responding to hybrid in San Juans. So I think, um, I think there's just not enough data at those low intensities. And so maybe links aren't, either aren't responding to them in a consistent way, which is leading to a, a kind of an odd response um, different than we see from backcountry ski or snowmobile. And also there's just less of it on the landscape. So it might be that there's a ton of snowmobile and backcountry ski, like those were our primary kinds of recreation and that's enough to um, push a lynx into changing its behavior in a certain way, but maybe there's just not enough of that hybrid um, on the landscape. And so the lynx aren't responding in the same way, but you're right, it's a weird response. It's odd that that they didn't respond similarly to um, that because it is a motorized type of recreation, it, it kind of stymied us as well. And that's kind of, that's why we say we, set, we found a nuanced response to recreation. It wasn't completely what we expected. And we don't really know why we don't see the same response in hybrid as we do to the other types of motorized. But I think the study area is the most um, likely thing that I can think of, just that it's not everywhere and it's more in that veil location. So, so kind of a weird reaction. It's a good question. I wish I knew. <laughs> well, thank you for your insight. That's very helpful. We had another great question. Um, in our mountain areas, we see a lot of wildlife, um, just even like right outside of our doors or on ski resorts all over the place when we're recreating. Is there any, I guess this is kind of a two-part question we got. Um, is it likely that we would see a lynx in the winter time? Like, is there human, do humans see lynx that often? And are there any cases of lynx actually going into um, maybe more like countryside areas and near people's homes? 
We don't typically see very much reaction with links, interaction with links, just being around people's homes. Um, they're pretty elusive. They um, definitely avoid people. They're interesting in that if you're out and you walk by a lynx, they don't really like flush and run away from you. They kind of hunker down and hide. So they're it's they're hard to spot and they're elusive, but they're not, they don't seem super shy, <laughs> which is kind of a contradiction. So if you're out and you come across one, like often you will see them, but it's just that they are really rare on the landscape. There's not very many of them until your your odds of of just seeing one and they're really cryptic. They're the, a good color to blend in. They're just hard to spot. Um, we don't see them coming down mostly because of those habitat differences that I mentioned. People are generally um, lower in elevation and kind of along body, valley bottoms like where they don't want to live. You, We do have people that catch them on game cameras around their houses when they live up in the woods. So they will kind of come around your house if you live up in their habitat. Um, we have somebody in Montana who has been catching one on the game camera around his house for a few summers now. So you, you could see them. And also they leave, they're very mobile in their territories. So if you have one around you, you will almost 100% see tracks from them moving around. So if you're out in the woods and you see, um, you're looking for tracks, if there is one in that area, you'll probably spot the tracks because they're very um, mobile in their home ranges. So keep looking. <laughs> Yeah, keep your eye out. <laughs> David asked if you have any insight on the lynx population trends since their reintroduction in, did you say the uh, late 90s? Mm -hmm. They have, we were introduced from 99 to 2006. Um, we have not kept, you know, and have not done specific studies to see how many they are. there are, so I don't, um, can't quote you actual population numbers. I know that the ones, you know, we do monitor uh, how the ones that got reintroduced did. And, and there are, you know, kittens of kittens that were reintroduced. So we're maybe on like, you know, multiple generations in from those um, first founder individuals. So they're doing well enough to uh, set up populations and to establish kittens and um, kind of fill the available areas. They spread from the San Juans up into Vail. So they were initially released, um, you know, in the south and then they kind of moved up and filled the, um, habitat areas that were friendly to them. Um, so they're, they're doing fairly well in the state, it seems, but we don't have a good um, population indication of them right now. And that is something that uh, we are thinking of trying to, to work on. And I know the state is working on as well. Great. And I, it looks like we have time for just one more question. Mm -hmm. um, let's see here. John asked a very interesting question. If lynx do well in the summer, how would climate change and decreasing snowpack be either detrimental or potentially a benefit if summer were a little bit longer? That's a good question. Um, I think climate change overall is going to push hair out of an area. So they do well, you know, summer is an easier season because the prey are there. But as climate change shifts the vegetation and the prey just entire structure out of an area, so it's gonna move you know, the types of trees and the type of plants, everything's gonna get drier. And so those hairs that the lynx need, they're just gonna be completely gone. So they won't even be there in the summer. It's gonna be a different set of um, like species ecotypes. So basically it's, gonna, it's just gonna push them out. Um, so for a while, they probably would do okay with a few more hairs, but eventually, you know, the climate's going to change too much to support hairs at all. Thank you for that insight. Um, and thank you so much for joining us tonight. As this um, study was so close to our home, um, very near and dear to us, this was really wonderful to have, um, to have you here. So thank you so much. Um, thank you, everybody, for all of the wonderful questions. We hope that you will join us for next week's or our next Naturalist Nights, which is in two Thursdays. And Lucretia, thank you again. We are so grateful um, for you and your entire team to be doing this research and sharing your expertise with us so that we can also be encouraging land managers to 
um, make decisions that benefit our local wildlife populations. So thank you again. I know that some of the Q and A's were people just thanking you. Um, and we have a lot of thank yous in the chat too. So um, I did go ahead and post those links in the chat box to your um, research papers. So, and I will send those out in an email either tomorrow or on Monday as well to everybody. So everyone keep your eyes out for those. Go ahead and check out those research papers if you want to learn more. You can also connect with Lucretia and learn more about her studies and what she's working on lately. So thank you so much again. Yeah, thank you. It was great. It was great to talk with everybody. Um, super fun and really good questions. Thank you. Absolutely. So everybody have a wonderful night and we will see you in two weeks on Thursday. Thank you, Lucretia. Have a great one. Thanks. Thank <laughs> you.